uh, starting with our first question, and I would like to start with Mrs. Castillo. So Mrs. Castillo, uh, can we start from the beginning? Could you share with us uh, how the nearshoring boom began in Mexico? What were the key economic and geopolitical factors that initiated this trend? And how did Mexico initially respond to this emerging opportunity? Well, first of all, thank you very much to uh, Comexi and the Policy Center for the New South for this invitation. Now, um, I'll start with uh, the first question. Um, I have to say that um, I do not consider that Mexico is living in a nearshoring boom yet. Of course, positive things are happening, but I don't think we can talk about a boom at this point. And in fact, there is the risk of losing the opportunity of talking about it if the new administration does not solve certain key issues such as the availability of energy, particularly clean energy, water, and infrastructure. And I mentioned a new administration because, as some of you might uh, be aware of, this weekend we are having a national election for a president as well as for a new Congress, among some other positions. Um, and in Mexico, we will have a new president starting in October, and the views in the public policies towards near sharing and the way to take advantage of it will be key. Um, I mentioned that there are some positive things that are happening, and some of them are uh, that between January and April of this year, based on a statement made by the Secretary of Economy, there has been 93 new investment announcements that represent 36.2 billion of US dollars. In 2023, 110 billion US dollars were announced too. So many of the main investors are in the US, Germany, Argentina, and China. Foreign direct investment in Mexico is also increasing. And in fact, it has reached a record high, uh, particularly in this uh, trimester, the first trimester of 2024. However, most of it comes from reinvestment of companies that already were already established in Mexico, and just a little percentage comes from new investments. Furthermore, the demand for industrial land is increasing, and based on the Association of Private Industrial Parks in Mexico, the MPIP, it will continue like this in the next five years. Today, there is still little back in the spaces for companies that want to come to Mexico, which shows that there's an increase in the demand for companies to, to come here. And the most um, demanded ones are located particularly in the border state with the U.S. in the north part of Mexico. Moreover, Mexico's market share in the U.S. imports reached 15.5% in March, over the 11.3% that came from China, which shows that the recomposition of the U.S. market favors companies established in Mexico. Now, related with the factors that initiated this trend, definitely um, was the trade and technology war between the U.S. and China that started a near showing trend due to structural geopolitical changes. That can be dated back to, uh, from a point of view, 2015, with the announcement made by China of its strategic plan name Made in China 2025, that was followed by a series of subsidies towards the growth of China's technology sector and the reaction of the US administration, particularly the Trump administration. Following this, following this the impact of the pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine conflict made it clear the need to relocate and protect value chains. U.S. is rewriting its trade policies and with it, the world trade. We have seen that within the Biden administration, the U.S. is no longer looking to negotiate new treaties to increase its market share. Today, the U.S. is looking to protect its value chains and decoupling them from China, bringing imports from closer, bringing imports from closer markets. Furthermore, the U.S. is focusing its efforts in its industrialization and in bringing back to the country investments. The approval of the three key laws, such as the Infrastructure Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chief and Science Act, are key in these efforts that come along with a near showing wave. Now, there are some other elements that we should consider when talking about Mexico and near showing. The first one, of course, is the location in geography. And we have access to the Pacific, the Gulf of Mexico, the US, and of course, we are connected with Central America and South America. This privileged location gives us logistics advantages. Also, the trade treaties network that Mexico has is very important. We have 40 treaties with 50 countries and more than 30 investment protection treaties. And when talking about treaties, of course, the most important one is the USMCA. Um, annual US goods trade with Mexico and Canada partners to the United States Mexico Canada Agreement, the USMCA, is nearly 1.6 trillion US dollars. 
supporting supply chains that are the foundation of the U.S. economic power. Every minute, 3 million uh, U.S. dollars in trade is generated between the North American countries. Besides the USMCA, Mexico has a mature manufacturing market with sectors already integrated with North America, and particularly with the U.S., such as automotive industry and electronics. Just to mention some examples that put the country in an easier route towards having companies participating in the value chain of sectors that the U.S. is promoting today, such as semiconductors. For example, today Mexico is the eighth producer of electronics in the world, has an industry with low carbon cost, already has educated labor, and a strong manufacturing base, which make it easier for uh, Mexican companies and companies interested in getting into the value chain of semiconductors do, do so. Other examples are electric vehicles, particularly batteries. Mexico, for example, can take advantage of the IRA because uh, to get all, all, or to unlock all the benefits of consumer credits included in this act, it is stated that on an incremental manner starting at 40% in 2023 and up to 80% in 2030, the percentage of critical uh, minerals for the batteries must be recycled, extracted, or processed in a country with which the U.S. has a free trade agreement. At the same time, the batteries shall be manufactured or assembled in North America. So companies from all over the world come to Mexico because we have a developed ecosystem and it makes sense from a business point of view. And I will leave it in the, there. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa, for this comprehensive uh, overview. So you have uh, explained that there is not uh, properly said uh, uh, nearshoring bomb in Mexico because there is much to be to be done. But you specified that there is a great potential in the, the Mexican economy, uh, especially the geographical location, the treaties that the, the country has, especially the USMCA, and also the, the emerging manufacturing sector of Mexico. And uh, uh, to to add on uh, what you said, I would like to ask Mr. Uh, Rubli, uh, about uh, if if you have any uh, additional uh, or further insights, and also I would like to to know um, how did me uh, Mexico initially uh, receive the influx of of nearshore investments, and what what are the challenges uh, that uh, that are faced by businesses and the government, and what are the strategies and policies uh, that were implemented to address these challenges, particularly in terms of infrastructure, uh, regulatory adjustment, industrial policy, etc., and how effective are these uh, measures in, in these early stages? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, I thank the Policy Center for the South, for the New South, for this invitation and also for Comexi. Uh, I think it will be a very uh, uh, fruitful discussion. No? Well, uh, at the outset, let me say that I completely agree with what uh, Vanessa just uh, told us, that uh, nearshoring is uh, seen as a very important opportunity for uh, boosting the development of the country, but it's a process in the making. No, It's just starting. We are, have, let's say, two years that uh, this started. And, uh, and of course, uh, in the wake of a presidential election, as uh, Vanessa mentioned, uh, <clears throat> things have slowed down because there is always an attitude of well, wait and see. Let's wait until the uncertainty of the, any election that is normal uh, just gets over and then we will address uh, whatever comes next. No? Uh, well, let me just compliment that uh, uh, how we took this opportunity. No? Well, first of all, I think that uh, there was a complete uh, consciousness by part of the policymakers and also of the private sector that nearshoring should not be seen as a substitute for the continuing effort of free trade policy, in, uh, especially in the framework of the US-Mexico-Canada agreement and also, of course, others. No? Be because from a trade policy point of view, nearshoring is a typical trade diversion process. So one has to keep that in mind for not slowing our openness through free trade policies. No? So nearshoring is a substitute. It's not a substitute, it's a complement to all our uh, policy, policy efforts. No? Now, uh, the big opportunity, the great opportunity that nearshoring offers uh, has been recognized by international organizations. For instance, the Inter-American Development Bank, the IDB, uh, has mentioned that uh, among Latin America, Mexico has the largest potential 
to benefit from, from the near shoring. No? Uh, there are many factors, of course, the, uh, uh, Mexico's geographic proximity and uh, also cultural and uh, other features that are important to the to from Mexico to the US no it's trade integration with the United States and Canada and of course very important the lower labor costs as compared to China that the Mexican economy can can offer no now as you mentioned uh, there are of course many shortcomings which are challenges which have to be addressed and they have to be addressed in a private public sector cooperation framework. No, it's not just that this is a matter for the public policy or a matter for the private sector in its uh, uh, trade strategies. No, it has to be a private public cooperation framework. No, now in this sense, uh, you asked how, what obstacles uh, we have uh, uh, faced in the process. No. And well, I can mention at least nine or ten of these uh, uh, shortcomings that uh, that have to be addressed. No, first of all, uh, Vanessa already mentioned it. There is the, the question of the quality and quantity of infrastructure, including warehouses. This is very important. No, we need huge space uh, for uh, building warehouses. Uh, near the factories that are uh, producing the, the, the goods and the, uh, in this framework. No? Now, second and related to the infrastructure is, of course, we have to improve the process of logistics. And this includes, very importantly, all kinds of transportation. Third, we need to boost a technological modernization and improving, very important, the digital connectivity of the country and of the areas where nearshoring is moving. No, I already mentioned the access to skilled labor. That's very important. No, uh, and uh, something that we have seen in this government in the past uh, two three years that uh, nearshoring started is that uh, the uncertainty that uh, surrounds this private sector, anti-private sector rhetoric of the actual government has to be uh, overcome or has to be minimized. No, It has been very difficult for the private sector to uh, operate uh, within this government given this anti-private sector rhetoric. So this, of course, has to be stopped in the next administration. No? Uh, you also mentioned deregulation. It's very important to cut down on red tape, which we have plenty still in Mexico. No? Uh, and the lack of the rule of law and insecurity also have to be addressed because they are uh, important hindrances for uh, nearshoring. And then also, as Vanessa already mentioned, there is the uh, scarcity of energy, especially clean sources of energy, and uh, water supply, which are very serious problems. And last but not least, I would like to emphasize that uh, nearshoring asks for a competitive fiscal framework. And I would say that in that sense, Mexico has made some pro progress. There have been specific policies in this matter. No? For instance, the authorities have taken initial steps in this direction because in late 2023, the government announced a set of fiscal incentives, very important, to promote investment and human capital formation in a specific group of sectors. These incentives include, well, first, immediate tax deductions of significant percentages of the new investments made by firms that are expected to export at least 50% of their output in the remainder of 2023 and in this year, 2024. And uh, second, an additional 25% deduction of the increase in workforce training expenses. No? So those are steps in the right direction. And these steps, of course, are going to be maintained uh, in the next uh, uh, public administration. No? Uh, now, you also asked about the strategies and policies that were implemented to address these challenges. Of course, there uh, is consciousness about these challenges and they are being addressed uh, more or less by the uh, authorities and by the private sector. But very important, the strategies uh, also have to be emphasized at the local 
government level because there are where the nearshoring opportunities are moving and it's not only federal government policies it's very important that uh, uh, at the state level the states take the necessary measures to uh, create the necessary incentives to it no uh, now how, how effective all these measures have been in these early stages well as vanessa mentioned it's too early to tell we hope that uh, they move continue moving in the right direction but uh, to evaluate this the effectiveness of these policies i would say that it's too early to tell okay thank you thank you very much uh, mr uh, rubli for shedding light on uh, on these uh, challenges faced by uh, the the, um, the nearshoring landscape in Mexico, you have mentioned the quality and quantity of infrastructure, the process of logistics, uh, technological and digital connection, access to skilled labor, etc. And uh, you've uh, you've uh, highlighted a very important point, which is the the importance of cooperation between private and public uh, sectors to address these challenges. Um, so I would like to move to uh, to Professor uh, Jaidi. Uh, to hear about uh, the, the Moroccan experience. And I would like to ask uh, Professor Jaidi, uh, could you talk about the timeline and the key drivers that marked the beginning of nearshoring in Morocco? And how was this initiative received by uh, local industries and the government? And what were the initial strategies and policies implemented to attract uh, nearshoring investments? And how effective uh, were these measures in the early stages? Thank you. Uh, first uh, of all, I, I think that uh, the diversification of uh, supply chains and uh, nearshoring is uh, creating uh, emerging uh, flows in trade and uh, in uh, FDI that are uh, set to grow the, the economy, Moroccan economy. Uh, and the challenge uh, to be met is uh, uh, to, uh, to have these opportunities and to, to take this opportunity for development, for the future development. And uh, over the past few years in Morocco, uh, as uh, in other regions uh, in Latin America or in Asia, the subject of global supply chain uh, diversification has been uh, very widely discussed. Uh, most uh, attention is paid to uh, the US and EU uh, imports and investment from countries that serve as uh, alternatives to China. Uh, due to their less well-established industrial structures and technology, technological uh, know-how, the demand for uh, the final products uh, from these uh, locations has resulted in uh, rapid uh, intermediate goods or raw materials import from China to support this process. However, uh, with the United States and uh, the EU's uh, desire to de-risk from China, it is logical to anticipate a gradual increase in uh, the intermediate trade in investment also among uh, some countries, some proximity countries, as uh, Mexico or, uh, or Morocco. Uh, I think that uh, uh, in Morocco, uh, maybe from a long date, from a long date, uh, Morocco uh, has established an economic uh, framework and uh, a business uh, laws that uh, promotes uh, the economic development of the country, but also the attractivity of uh, FDI and the nearshoring. Uh, and in order to achieve this uh, this goal, Morocco has uh, launched uh, since the early of 1990s uh, a series of legal uh, reform designed to modernize the legal and regulatory framework from business 
amend and modify several legislation and uh, codes, including uh, the commercial code, the Anti-Semitism Charter, the intellectual uh, property law, the law of freedom of, uh, of pricing and competition, the law of uh, public and private uh, partnership, the law on uh, public limited companies and the Arbitration Act, and so on. And furthermore, uh, Morocco's accession to uh, first the World Trade Organization and in second the, the ratification of the free trade agreement with uh, uh, the European Union but also with the United States have uh, served as a catalyst for uh, the process uh, to, of uh, legislative reform, additional legislative reform. So many reforms have been adopted in the uh, last decades in order, as I said, to establish a transparent and uh, predicatable investment climate, such as uh, the investment charter. Uh, so I think that also Morocco has a particularity in, in the region. He has a strategic location for investment and trade, a regional exporting hub, Morocco launched strategic projects as the, the Tangier made port, uh, which is today the first uh, uh, transshipment platform in Africa and connected to nearly 200 ports around the world uh, with a large uh, treatment capacity. And uh, we have also, uh, or the public policy, have uh, accorded to uh, to the competitive and qualified force uh, labor force a very important uh, attention. Uh, Morocco benefits from a young and competitive workforce, but uh, yeah, this workforce have to be trained to be qualified for uh, to be uh, in inclu included in in a new industrial development or project development. Uh, so also, I think that uh, one of the objectives of uh, the public policy is uh, the integrated industrial platform, which was uh, which has been created and dedicated to industrial zones across the country, among which uh, we have free zones. This uh, free zones offering uh, numerous uh, advantages or. Uh, local investment and uh, local integration. And um, the most important, I think, uh, factor uh, to, uh, to, to mention in, in, this, in this point is the political stability of Morocco. I think that it is uh, a very important factor. Morocco is considered in the region as, as a stable country both uh, politically and economically, uh, thanks to uh, the orientation of uh, public policy and uh, the openness and democracy, uh, etc. And you have uh, uh, in Morocco a strong macroeconomic environment, and this uh, macroeconomic environment uh, is a challenge uh, in, in the disturbed uh, environment now in the world, uh, and it is uh, uh, a real uh, uh, additional factor to attract uh, investment. So uh, I think that even if the framework is important to uh, to attract uh, investment uh, from uh, Europe or from abroad, uh, I, uh, what what I want to to mention is. Uh, uh, is the, the relation with the European Union. It is uh, our first and important uh, partner uh, in uh, trend and in investment. And, uh, and government measures um, had been taken to, to motivate uh, FDI from uh, European enterprise in, in, in Morocco. Uh, I think also that uh, 
uh, or in with the specific agreements with uh, with uh, uh, Europe, uh, you have the, the the sectorial strategy in Morocco, which are very important to create uh, an entity uh, in uh, in in the investment uh, uh, from from Europe. I mean uh, the industrial acceleration plan uh, from uh, 2040 to 2020. Uh, he was, it was uh, launched in uh, 2040, uh, uh, and uh, it is a vast uh, project of economic modernization to attract uh, more FDI in the industrial sector, and the plane uh, aimed uh, at uh, establishing ecosystems that integrate value chains and supplier relationships between uh, large European companies and uh, Moroccan uh, firms, uh, mainly uh, small and uh, medium enterprise. And uh, among other results, results, the plan created uh, 45 industrial system in partnership with uh, professional association and uh, universities in uh, various sectors and their uh, generalization to all the regions of Morocco but by uh, integrating uh, small and medium enterprise and by uh, placing uh, industry at the heels of uh, economic and technological transformations. All, uh, and I think that after the positive result of uh, the industrial acceleration plan, the government launched a second phase for uh, 21, 2021 to 2025, uh, focused mainly on the consolidation of uh, the achievements made with uh, uh, within the framework of the first uh, phase of the plan, and uh, among the reasons to invest in Morocco for European uh, firms and uh, American or, or other or other uh, other uh, investors, there are this uh, legal framework and uh, uh, an assistance measures very favorable to, to investors. But on, on, on the other hand, Morocco still has a, a relatively small internal market. Uh, and uh, we observe that there is uh, significant social and regional disparities and a weak of in productivity, uh, notably industrial productivity. And uh, in some sectors, a law of competitiveness. And uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, there are the main challenges for, for the next uh, step for the growing, for, the, for developing the, the economic growth and uh, attract investment from Europe or elsewhere. Uh, but I, will, I want to, to, to signal a point uh, despite the trend of nearshoring or free insuring uh, between Europe and and Morocco or between United States and uh, and uh, and uh, Mexico, uh, I, uh, I I think that uh, there there are new perspectives with new nearshoring, as we mentioned in in uh, in, in the precedent uh, intervention. But I, I think that Asia is a very competitive pole for uh, Morocco and for also for uh, for maybe for 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 uh, for Mexico because uh, i think that asia is uh, has uh, many advantages uh, to develop and uh, industrialization in some sectors and i think back to europe we we observe that uh, the main uh, firms in Europe are looking to Asia more than looking to uh, North of Africa. Maybe because uh, the st economic stability in all the region of North Africa is not uh, very encouraging the, the, the investment. And uh, the political tension between uh, Algeria and Morocco is one of, uh, of uh, the, big, the big problems. But I think that uh, if uh, this uh, 
situation uh, uh, is going uh, for for the next uh, next year. Uh, it was the reason for this that Morocco wants to develop uh, uh, its economy or industrial economy as a hub between Europe and Africa. And he developed now uh, a new approach to develop its uh, Atlantic facade or Atlantic coast to to from the north to south on Africa in uh, in uh, a new approach collective approach to be uh, more attractive for the investments because uh, uh, today the the attractiveness of investment is uh, it, it depends from the capacity not for only one 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 country but a region at all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jaidi, for this uh, a very insightful overview. Uh, you've talked about the importance of the reforms done by Morocco in the early stages in the 1990s uh, regarding the business laws, um, business environments, but also uh, the uh, the um, access of Morocco to the WTO and the, the agreements, trade agreements with the EU and the US and how these were drivers for the, the nearshoring and uh, were, were uh, factors that attracted investments. You've talked also about um, strategic projects, industrial zones, and also some um, assets that Morocco has like political stability and economic stability and sectoral pol policies. Um, so I would like to to um, to circle back to Mrs. Uh, Vanessa. Uh, and I would like to ask you, uh, based on the uh, the uh, the elements you've discussed before, uh, what what can you tell us about the main successes and failures uh, in in the the Mexican um, uh, experience? Are there any specific uh, case studies from specific sectors, for example? And also, uh, in, in, from your perspective, what are the policies or initiatives that uh, you think have contributed to to these uh, outcomes? Uh, Mrs. Vanessa, you are on mute. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Um, so I I agree with Federico. I think it's a little bit too early to judge if policies are working or not. However, I will say that a success definitely was uh, the easy USMCA. Uh, and I think it was very important that this administration took a pragmatic decision, which is not common uh, for this administration uh, to, to take that kind of decisions based more on the pragmatic part and less on the ideologic part. Uh, but they did, and, and they they um, ratified the USMCA, even though it was a treaty negotiated by a previous administration. So I think that was key uh, for the for this administration. Um, However, the treaty has a history that goes back to this nearshoring wave. It wasn't really a decision thinking about nearshoring, but it was more a decision thinking that it made sense for the, the Mexican economy um, at large. Now, um, I believe that taking uh, advantage of this opportunity has been pushed company has has been pushed more by companies interested in participating in the value chains of key sectors, and not really by the current administration. Although there is a recognition and consensus that. Um, this nearshoring opportunity can be transformative for the country and really make a difference within our economy. Not much has been done related with public policies or industrial policies. Um, it is worth to mention, and Federico already explained it in detail, that the Secretary of Finance last October published a decree with different incentives for the attraction of investments in key sectors related with U.S. strategic sectors such as electric vehicles, electronics, semiconductors, to mention just some, and also to push the development of human capital. But the incentives were just for two fiscal years, 2023 sorry, and 2024. Now, um, the leading candidates, uh, including their proposals, policies related with infrastructure that has to do with trade, the support of the construction of industrial parks, generation of cleaner energy and cheaper energy. However, I guess we have to wait and see if all those promises become real and if the next administration does implement an industrial policy as well as the, uh, as a state effort 
to complement um to complement it in areas such as infrastructure, water, and energy. So I would like to focus a little bit more on um, energy. So in order to fully embrace the near sharing and the integration with North America by developing a stronger supply chains, we need to think about the country's energy transition, as well as increasing the presence of renewables in our energy matrix. Um, today, almost 75% of the electricity generated in Mexico comes from fossil fuels. 59% is natural gas, 16% uh, comes from diesel and fuel oil, and uh, today in the Mexican matrix, only 5% comes from solar, and 6% comes from wind, and 13% from other clean sources, including hydroelectric. So the political will of the next government will be key. We need public policy that leads Mexico towards a cleaner energy matrix, and uh, a strategic planning that can take us there. And that considers not only generation of clean energy, but also the infrastructure needed to take it where it is required. Talking about planning the electricity infrastructure, our constitution is very clear about it. Electricity planning is an activity reserved to the state and uh, the state is the sole responsible for, of it. And for that purpose, the Ministry of Energy publishes a, a plan um, for the next um, 30 years that is called PRODESEN, and it is renewed each year. Um, also, we have an electricity, uh, electric industry law, and, and that is very clear in stating that the objective of planning is to satisfy the demand and to fulfill the clean energy objectives. So in order to do so, the next administration will have to do different actions. First, on the generation side, uh, they will have to promote clean energy generation, not only with the utilities national company, the CFE, but also with different business models that allows private participation. And for that, permits should be awarded in, awarded in all plants that run based on fossil fuels, such as fuel oil or diesel, shall be closed or replaced. Uh, although this administration announced the construction of a photovoltaic plant in the north part of Mexico, it is not enough to really fulfill Mexico's international commitments and to satisfy the clean energy requirements of global companies coming to Mexico. Uh, at this point, we can see that around 1.8 to 2 gigawatts of renewable energy are at the standby due to a lack of permits granting from either the regulator or because the utilities, the national utilities company, is not granting the interconnection and this needs to be solved um, in the very short term. Uh, a second point that is urgent is, is for the next administration, it, it is urgent to invest in transition and distribution of electricity. This administration made minimal investments on in this area and is key to take the electricity where needed, particularly when talking about taking advantage of reassuring. Again, this, uh, the national plan for uh, the electricity system shows a significant lag in transmission and distribution projects. So between 2015 and between 2022, the Ministry of Energy mandated the utilities company and specifically the utilities part of the company that is in charge of transmission and distribution, the construction of 318 projects. And by 2022, only 30 of them were done, which represents just 9.4% of the total. And moreover, between 2020 and 2022, the length of the transmission lines increased only by 0.17%. So we see that there is a lack of investment in transmission and distribution, and this also could be confirmed with the 2024 budget. Even though uh, for 2024, uh, the budget that was awarded to the utilities company uh, was the highest budget since the beginning of the administration, um, uh, the, the part of the transmission and distribution is getting less money, 31% and 24% respectively. So, and we're really looking at the consequences of this lack of investment in transmission and distribution. Um, in some uh, states uh, that are uh, getting most of the investments, uh, especially in the north part of Mexico, such as Nuevo León or Coahuila, uh, they, um, the, some permits haven't been granted based on the idea that the system or the national electric system will be overloaded in the next four years. There's also a case, for example, of a, a state in the center of Mexico that is um, that is named Querétaro, where uh, the government state made a, a very important effort and created a public policy to promote um, to promote it as a hub for data centers. And, and, and now uh, they are facing a problem and they are struggling to get the electricity needed because the transmission and distribution lines are full. And the project it was supposed to be built in phases and now um, they, there's a risk of not being able to get all the, 
all the phases done because of a lack of electricity uh, and um, a lack of electricity. So um, also again talking about Nuevo León, which is one of the main receivers of the of uh, foreign direct investment of new uh, new investments. Um, there's uh, about uh, 900 megawatts uh, of electricity demanding connection, uh, but they're just staying there in line waiting for the regulator to get them the the permit. So it is a strategic to develop the transmission lines uh, in some very strategic corridors in Mexico to really um, be able to take a full advantage of the near sharing. Um, now, also talking about energy, there's another point that should be considered for, especially for the next administration, and that is to take advantage of some other new technologies for the generation of other green fuels, for example, the green hydrogen, and the need to have a national strategy for its development. And um, another point will be the need to decarbonize the state-owned companies, both in the oil and gas sector and in the electricity sector. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa, for uh, this explanation. You have mentioned uh, many interesting uh, uh, top, uh, questions and points that uh, the government, the Mexican government, needs to focus on in order to um, to take advantage of uh, nearshoring and uh, to position in itself in the global uh, economy. You've mentioned uh, the importance of energy transition. Uh, and also uh, the importance of uh, investing in electricity transmission and distribution, and also green fuels such as green hydrogen. And um, I think this is very important, especially given the global trend to transition to um, new, uh, to uh, green technologies and clean energy, green net energy, and clean energy. Sorry. Uh, so. I would like to continue the discussion with uh, Mr. Uh, Federico, uh, and I would like to ask you, uh, uh, what is uh, your perspective on the future outlook for nearshoring in Mexico over maybe the next five to 10 years? And uh, do you think there are, there are some emerging sectors that could benefit more than others? And also, uh, what lessons can Mexico learn and what lessons can we learn from the, the, the Mexican experience in regarding the nearshoring uh, activities? Yes, of course. Uh, well, let me start by just uh, highlighting a problem in terms of identifying and registering investment flows of nearshoring. We have to be very cautious because not all FDI is due to nearshoring, as we know, no? but there is a tendency, especially in Mexico, to do so, but this implies a big overestimation of nearshoring. No? Now, of course, identifying and registering such flows is not an easy task. It implies a careful research and examination of the firms wanting to invest in Mexico. So I would say that we have not a credible and complete registry of nearshoring. No? What we have are statements, anecdotal evidence, indirect evidence and uh, plans of the firms that suggest that we can somehow approach the, uh, quantitatively how much nearshoring we can expect uh, in the near future. No? Uh, now, for instance, just to show this point, no, uh, the authorities last year revealed that they have registered intentions of firms to invest in the form of nearshoring of about $40 billion. Uh, we have to keep in mind that more or less foreign direct investment in Mexico per year is about uh, between 32 and 36 uh, billion, billion US dollars. No? So 40 billion just for nearshoring is of course a huge number. But they did not say in what time span they were expecting this $40 billion to materialize. No? Uh, so there you can see that there is a mixture in that figure of normal FDI flows and nearshoring flows. No? And then, of course, we have had some non-fulfilled promises because within this 40 billion, there were considered 10 billion, the intention of 10 billion of the Tesla plant in the northern part of, uh, of Mexico. But this now is just has, has been put on hold. So uh, the Tesla investment, I think up to now, 
is like a big fiasco, no? unfortunately. Now, uh, there have been nearshoring investments, just looking for the outlook, uh, for the future outlook in the next five or maybe 10 years. No, there have been nearshoring investment announcements in various industries, including motor vehicle manufacturing and uh, automotive parts, furniture, home appliances, toys, among others. No? Moreover, there has been a significant increase in US imports from Mexico in specific sectors where Mexico has a comparative advantage, such as computer and electronic products, electrical equipment, machinery, and beverages, which are typical sectors where nearshoring is uh, emphasizing their uh, intentions. No? Uh, now, I would, uh, I, I would like to highlight some sectors that exhibit already uh, nearshoring benefits and that are, are expected to have a great future potential. And uh, let me just show in two slides uh, this point, no? What we have here. Okay, this is, uh, this is the map of Mexico. And uh, as you can see, the, the dark green are the uh, larger nearshoring intentions of investments. And as you can see, it is uh, completely uh, concentrated very much in the northern part of Mexico. So nearshoring, of course, has regional disparities uh, that have to be addressed. And there are opportunities to, to, to change this because, for instance, take this very southern part state. This state is called Yucatan. It's in the southern part in the southern peninsula. No? Well, Yucatan has a big potential because it's very close to the US, because you just take this route here uh, in, in the Gulf and you are in Florida. So Yucatan is a border state, such, so, such to speak, uh, to the US. And there's a big opportunity if you develop uh, uh, good infrastructure and uh, good connectivity from this state to, uh, to the United States. No? And this, of course, can contribute to having better benefits or more widespread benefits that can uh, uh, reduce the regional disparities that we are uh, seeing in the country. So, of course, it's natural to expect that these two states that are border states with the US, it's of course expected that they show a bigger potential for uh, nearshoring benefits because uh, connectivity and transportation and so on is much more developed here. But, of course, I agree completely with what Vanessa just said. A big, big, big problem is, of course, to face uh, the, the, the scarcity of energy, not only in the north part, but in the whole, in the whole country. You know? and, uh, and here I'm just showing the sectors that in the next years uh, are definitely sectors that are uh, potential for uh, reaping the benefits of nearshoring. There is the semiconductor and other components sector. That's where it all started with the, with the microchips. That's where the whole process started after the pandemic. Then office furniture, agriculture, construction and mining machinery, steel products, other metal products, metal working machinery, paper products, foundries, non-ferrous metal products, <coughs> uh, computer and peripheral equipment. And so it's all in all these manufacturing opportunities uh, have to be uh, emphasized. No? Now, uh, just to round up um, about what we can learn from, from let me just take this off, uh, what we can learn from the Mexican experience so far, and especially from the experiences of other countries like Morocco, no? uh, I would summarize them in three points. No? We have mentioned lots of, uh, of points, but let me summarize it in three but I think are crucial elements and crucial uh, experiences that we have to learn and that we have to have in place if we want to have a nearshoring, a positive nearshoring uh, uh, process. No? Well, there are three. The first, of course, political stability is essential. So is the compliance with the rule of law and the enforceability of contracts. Second, infrastructure, as we have emphasized, is very, very important. No? We should not hesitate, the government should not hesitate in investing heavily in infrastructure projects. And third, I would like to highlight the importance of education of the workforce, because the labor market is crucial for the success of nearshoring and also to extend the benefits 
to uh, not only to entrepreneurs but also to the workers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Federico, for. Uh, this uh, very clear uh, analysis. Uh, uh, you've uh, listed uh, some of the sectors that are um, that are uh, positioned to benefit from nearshoring in Mexico. And finally, you've highlighted some lessons that Mexico can learn and implement in order to uh, fully benefit from its potential in this sector, uh, uh, especially political stability, infrastructure, and education. So uh, finally, I would like to uh, finish with Mr. Uh, Jaidi. Uh, Professor Jaidi, can you please uh, uh, talk to us about uh, Morocco's achievements in this sector, but also uh, the challenges and setbacks uh, in its uh, nearshoring journey, and what lessons can be drawn from the Moroccan experience? And finally, what are the remaining challenges uh, that need to be addressed, uh, and what specific solutions and policy adjustments can be uh, uh, implemented and please i will invite you to respond in five minutes so that we can uh, we we don't uh, uh, ex exceed our time yeah uh, i will try to have a response in uh, in short time i think that uh, significant effort in morocco uh, uh, has been done to modernize the economy and uh, encourage uh, efficiency and innovation and this uh, has resulted in a sectoral strategy. I think that the sectoral strategy is uh, the main uh, lesson we, we have from the experience of Morocco uh, to promote uh, nearshoring and to promote uh, attractive events of, uh, of FDI. Um, and uh, I think that uh, the other point, uh, the, the other important point is uh, the modernization of governance of sectorial policies. It is an important point to, uh, to take in account. Uh, uh, it is evident that we have other, other factors mentioned for in, in the case of, uh, of uh, Mexico, and, uh, and we share this, this point in, in, in Morocco. We have in good infrastructure, uh, very competitive, uh, uh, labor force and uh, uh, competences in 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 uh, the technological sector uh, and and so on, but I think that the challenge now for Morocco is uh, uh, to achieve uh, these assets and to uh, um, and I think the requirement of 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 this objective is uh, to develop. Uh, uh, Morocco's institutional, political, and macroeconomic stability, because I think that it is uh, a very, very important, uh, valuable, competitive advantage in in uh, in the region, but in the world, uh, and the world is is in uh, constant transformation and disruption. And the second point is the attractiveness of Morocco's offer, uh, which uh, combines proximity, competitiveness, and easy access to markets. Easy access to markets for uh, uh, foreign investors, but also for uh, local local firms. And the third point is uh, the massive development of uh, the infrastructure, as, as I said, because uh, it's enabled Morocco to offer a well-connected uh, economic and well connected country where the movement of uh, wood and data is smooth and uh, and uh, rapid so the significant uh, upcoming challenges is to capitalize uh, on these uh, assets and uh, the objectives of uh, the industrial policy or the public policy uh, globally is to increase no, not only uh, the share of the industry in the GDP by the integrated sectoral industry. Second is to improve uh, investors' reception capacity. I mean that uh, uh, the, firm, the Moroccan firms has to enhance their competitiveness, their management, 
and to be in uh, in in uh, valuable uh, relations with the, with with the, their partners uh, abroad. Third is to develop productivity because it's a real uh, uh, an impeachment factor to to grow in uh, in and to diversify and to stay in Morocco. Pro uh, target support to 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 the industrial base and support to uh, to to uh, to uh, labor force to uh, uh, and I think that to galvanize export capacity in quantitative and qualitative terms uh, uh, that are uh, the, the significant the significant upcoming challenge. But I think that we can. Resume these challenges in uh, uh, some points. The first is uh, to reinforce the industrial ecosystems for a more integrated uh, industry, as I said. Second is to encouraging the development of the private sector development. Mm -hmm. I mean uh, uh, a competitive uh, environment uh, and uh, a very transparent environment, business environment, uh, facilitate to facilitate uh, market creation and market access, um, to reinforce uh, capabilities of uh, the firms, and uh, access to finance for this uh, this uh, this uh, Moroccan firms. And the third point is improving the competitiveness of uh, small and medium enterprise, Moroccan enterprise, because until today there are not uh, very uh, integrated and applicated in the ecosystem, in the industrial ecosystem. Uh, other point is uh, to enhance the application of uh, the new investment charter. Uh, we have a new investment charter, uh, and I think this uh, new charter attempts to create the condition of uh, sustainability for the economy and uh, create more jobs. But the new charter includes supports uh, a new support system for 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 enterprise and for the region uh, another block of measures is to improve international position of morocco uh, i mean that uh, uh, morocco uh, has to uh, to develop uh, the free trade agreements uh, in uh, in equilibrium approach with europe uh, uh, and to reinforce the management and the governance of industrial policy. And last but not least, I think we have uh, two big challenges. The first is the decarbonization of, uh, of uh, the industry. Mm? It's a very important uh, uh, challenge because I think that uh, now Europe uh, is in transition to, uh, to a new environment. Uh, uh, for its industry or economy, and you have to 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 identify the main CBM relevant carbon intensive export of Morocco, and identify products that are one or two steps higher in the value chain, and to have a new politics to to develop uh, or to reinforce for decarbonization of industry, and the second point of the, the two big challenges is the digitalization. I think that the digitalization is not only important for uh, uh, for the for job potential, but also for the efficiency, for the productivity gains uh, in, 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 uh, in industry. And uh, it is also a tool to uh, in face of uh, market distortions. And uh, I think that we have to take the advantage of uh, digital economy potential in, 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 this, uh, in this vision. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jaidi, for this detailed analysis of Morocco's uh, journey in Nearshoreen, highlighting both the uh, uh, the assets but also the challenges. You've uh, mentioned a lot of uh, points that the industrial policy and policies, public policies in general, need to focus on. Uh, for example, developing productivity and uh, capacity of uh, private uh, sector uh, and private firms. 
uh, creating uh, an integrated industry ecosystem, uh, also improving uh, the the improving the framework of for SMEs and enhancing the implementation of the invest the investment charter, and you've uh, finished with uh, two important transformations that are critical for this uh, issue, which are uh, decarbonization and dig digitalization. So thank you very much for these insights. Uh, this discussion has been incredibly enriching to to all of us, and I would like to thank all of you, our distinguished speakers, Mrs. Vanessa Castillo, Mr. Federico. Rubli and Mr. Arabi Jaidi, you have provided us with important insights on a range, range of issues from the economic and geopolitical drivers that have shaped uh, nearshoring strategies at, in both Morocco and Mexico to the successes and challenges each country has encountered along the way, uh, as well as the hurdles that remain and need to be uh, addressed. Uh, as we move forward, it's clear that the journey of nearshoring is ongoing and ever evolving for Mexico and Morocco, and indeed for other nations considering the, this strategy. The, les the lessons uh, shared by you today underscore the importance of adaptability, proactive policymaking, and the need to foster environments and to attract uh, and sustain uh, investment. So uh, to 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 sum up, I would like to thank to thank everyone who joined us today, our speakers, attendees, and the organizers from the Policy Center and from the COMEXI. And also, I would like to invite the viewers to check out our website, uh, policycenter.ma, for for further insights and resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.